um, before we begin, it's my pleasure uh, to first introduce Noma's Art Stroll Coordinator, Martin Collins, who has a special statement to share with us tonight. Martin. Good evening, Michelle. Good evening, Aria. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us on Thursdays with Noma and Jessica Mafia, sponsored tonight by Lino Press, longtime printers in Washington Heights and beyond at 4482 Broadway and West 192nd Street. Anything, and I mean anything that you need printed, Lino Press will print it. They have done yeoman's work for 20 years for the Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance for the Uptown Art Stroll, printed all our posters, fans, palm cards, flyers, you name it, they've done it all. Lino Press is just a truly dynamic community partner. And uh, you can follow them on Instagram at Lino Press. Their website is really terrific. It's a concise resume of all services they offer linopressnyc.com and i believe that michelle has a picture from the 2017 uptown art school that uh, we would like to show folks it uh, shows a picture of uh, franklin nunez and myself in the background and in the foreground anna and pam their staffers who are just truly terrific lino press just a truly dynamic community partner and a strong supporter with unbridled support for noma and the Uptown Art Stroll for the past 20 years. So our thanks go out to Franklin, Anna, Pam, Hector, and the entire staff at Lino Press for sponsoring tonight's Thursdays with Noma and Jessica Mafia. Maria, back to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Martin. And thank you so much to Lino Press for your support and your continued friendship uh, with Noma. Good evening to all of you. We are thrilled to be back tonight for what is our final Thursdays with Noma for 2021. My name is Miria Leva Gutierrez, and I am the Executive Director of the Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance. Um, and before we begin tonight, I would like to thank the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs for their support of this program. And speaking of this program, we have now been at this for 20 months. Um, and as I've said many, many times, it has truly been um, a highlight over and over and over again. Um, and although the world may allow us to do this in person sometime in the near future, I hope, uh, we really have come to see the value in a program that allows participation from the comfort of one's home after dinner, maybe with a glass of wine, curled up on a sofa. And so we are excited to continue to bring this kind of programming to you. And we look forward to the possibility of a hybrid type in the new year so all of us can participate either in person or in a virtual setting. These evenings joyfully bring us together, allowing us to get to know one another in a dynamic and yes, fairly intimate, albeit virtual setting. And as you know, for those of you who have joined us week after week or on occasion, this program is an opportunity to get to know our amazing Uptown artists, an opportunity to learn something new or unexpected about these artists, and especially a chance for all of you to engage in conversation with our artists. So please, 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 Put your questions into the chat. Um, and when we begin our conversation with Jessica, uh, we will unmute you so that you can ask your questions directly. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce tonight's featured artist. Born in New York City, Jessica Mafia earned her BA from Vassar College and an MS from City College. She also trained at the Art Students League of New York. Since 2009, Jessica's works have been exhibited widely in shows and galleries in New York City, Vermont, California, Washington, New Mexico, and New Jersey, and are currently in the flat files of Pierogi Gallery in downtown Manhattan. In 2016, her installation, Lanterns for Peace, was exhibited in five states throughout the United States in response to the 2016 presidential elections. In 2021, her work, a self-portrait silhouette that connected the artist's interior and exterior landscapes, was featured in Noma's In and Out, Light and Dark, Women in the Heights virtual art exhibition. And most recently, she participated in the Audubon mural project, which we will hear much more about tonight and which is truly a fascinating fascinating project. Jessica is the recipient of several grants awarded by the Hell's Kitchen Foundation and the Puffin Foundation, as well as over a dozen residencies and fellowships. And not too long ago, she was an artist in residence at the United Plant Savers Artist Residency in Rutland, Ohio. She is also a curator and an instructor, having led numerous workshops in a variety of mediums. Her work has also been featured in over two dozen publications. Since 2017, 
2018, she has turned her attention to public art projects, an area to which she finds herself increasingly drawn. Most recently, a series of her photographs charting and documenting nature on 15 Broadway blocks, born out of the artist's quest to, quote, know the wild and to connect to the wisdom of the non-human and the poetry of the natural world, were recently on view at the Queen's Botanical Garden. In addition, her works are featured on the covers of Fabio Gironi's philosophy book, Naturali Naturalizing Badia's Mathematical Ontology and Structural Realism, and poet Frias Suleiman's latest book, As If My Name is a Mistaken Sign. In addition, her collages are used as the artwork for two of Childish Gambino's singles, Summertime Magic and Feels Like Summer. To say my two teenage sons were impressed by this piece of her experience, Extensive bio would be an understatement. Her solo exhibition at Denise Bibro Fine Art in Chelsea featured large photorealistic pencil drawings of urban cracks and residue produced, producing unexpectedly, unexpectedly, unexpectedly beautiful surfaces. Indeed, in her wide and varied body of work, Jessica seeks out the mundane, discovering the poetry and beauty that resides therein. An artist who, in her own words, is curious about the wilderness within, Jessica explores the porous boundaries between humans and the natural world. I am so excited to welcome Jessica tonight. And so, Jessica, I turn the mic over to you. Nelia, thank you so much for such a, 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 a beautiful write-up of my work. Thank you. Um, and I also want to say congratulations to Noma, because I heard that you guys got some wonderful funding recently, so that's very exciting. Um, so I just want to say hello and thank you everybody for coming tonight. And I'm going to turn it right back over to um, Michelle to show a little video, a little studio visit walkthrough I made the other day. Hi. My name is Jessica Mafia, and welcome to my studio. So I have an art studio here in Washington Heights that is part of the Chishama Space to Connect program. Chishama is this wonderful nonprofit that offers uh, subsidized studio space and presentation space for artists all around the city. And in this particular program, um, I have the great privilege of being able to teach the residents of this building art monthly workshops um, in exchange for studio space. So I'm gonna take you on a little tour of some of my work. Let's begin with some of my older work. So it's a small studio, but I make do. I uh, pack a lot into a little bit of space. Over here we've got the printer and uh, underneath there's the old school projector, my papers and books. Uh, collage materials, painting materials. Here's a lot of storage over here. Um, got a couple of desks for active working. Um, and then the wall space for seeing how the work looks. Of course, we've got the altar to nature and other artists. And some of the work in storage and here's the real storage area. I just completed this mural, which I'll talk about later. So I've had to integrate a whole ton of materials into this tiny space. Anyway, when I first started making professionally a decade ago or so, I began by making these assemblages out of found books um, in which I would insert photographs that I took or found imagery, add some glass and turn them into these little vignettes, these little surreal vignettes. So I have a whole series of these book assemblages. And then I moved on to creating these large scale pencil drawings um, of cracks and residue on walls. Please forgive the reflection. So I would work from photographs I had taken on walks all around New York City um, and blow up this, these images of scratched metal or um, residue of any uh, urban detritus generally and draw them really large in a way kind of honoring what's beautiful and overlooked. This here is cracked tar on my roof where I used to live on 137th Street. And here we have some more cracked tar. So this series um, took a long time. Each drawing was probably took about a month or some of them, the six feet ones took many, many months to make. Uh, so that 
series preoccupied me for four long years and here stacked in here is the proof of that um, from there I dabbled in many different series um, but then landed on another long-term series the self-portrait series um, called inner geographies which is a work in progress probably a lifelong work in progress um, in which I created these life-size silhouettes of myself um, and used imagery from nature to uh, to express my inner nature so this was the kind of the starting image the sea within this pencil drawing of the Hudson River um, and we've got this charcoal body of clouds so those are both drawings um, this one is on its side because I don't have room for it. It should be horizontal. This is the dreaming body. This is pastel um, and mugwort. Mugwort is that plant that grows everywhere in our parks. Grows, it's, quite, it's quite a prolific volunteer. Um, you don't have to look very hard to find it. Although this time of year, that's pretty, it's pretty dried up. But um, mugwort has tr been used, has had many medicinal purposes. Um, and one of them is for overactive dreaming. So this is the dreaming body. And here we've got the fire snake body, which is multi-layered. Um, it's got tinfoil armor on top, underneath. There are handmade rubber stamps of snakes and little people. There's a huddled little person in there. Let's see, there's a couple more huddled people. There you go, yeah. Um, I don't have it here in this studio right now, but I'm also working on an, an embroidery body, which I've been working on for a very long time. Took a long hiatus since COVID but I hope to return to it soon. It's a full body um, of embroidered flowers. So let's see, the bodies are still going on. Part of the body series includes these water-based photo transfers that I made of myself with a juvenile Northern goshawk. So this is part of a trilogy. Um, several, the. This three part series, they're all about 25 by 36 inches, but one of them, uh, two of them actually are six feet, became very large. I'm very partial to this image. Um, let's see, from there, I began to work on a series called Walking Broadway. So last November of 2020, I decided to do a project called Walking Broadway in which I walked the length of Broadway um, from the top of Manhattan to the very bottom and all through the Bronx. And I photographed an element of nature on every block, which means this series is comprised of over, you know, close to 300 images. So I photographed an element of nature and then I cut out a circle. So that's what this is. It's a cut circle collaged onto a piece of paper um, and then I labeled it with identifying features. So this is Golden Rain Tree on 177th Street, the Hackberry, Hackberry Bark on 176th, um, and this became a kind of walking poem in honor of the nature that is, and um, kind of mourning what is lost you know the city used to be uh, wildly biodiverse uh, verdant paradise so from this series i generated a lot of photo scraps because when i cut out the circles from the rectangle photograph there was a lot of scrap really high quality scrap this is really nice photo paper and so in order not to waste it i started a new series which I'm calling All the Birds I've Ever Met in New York City, 1983 to the present. We've got a seagull, we've got a starling, we've got a, a grackle and a house sparrow, a red-tailed hawk and a blue jay, a, gray, a catbird and a mallard, a mockingbird, 
a brown thrasher that was exciting to me. I became a real bird nerd during quarantine. A northern flicker, a robin. So, you know, if you look closely, you can see they're made up of all of these different recycled photo parts. You can see some tree barks in there and some soil. You'll see a lot of um, sidewalk. Um, so that project led me to collaborate with um, with Avi Gittler of, of Gittler and Gallery and the Audubon Mural Project. Um, so I proposed making a mural, my very first mural, my very first public ins installation. Um, first I showed Avi a kind of larger scale example of what I was making. This is a white crowned sparrow um, and I have hopes of installing this uh, nearby, making a little intervention, but this is paper. Um, so it would be quite a feat to weatherize paper. Um, but for my big mural, which I just completed a couple weeks ago, I, uh, I foraged all of this glass from Highbridge Park. This here is one of my little sample pieces that I learned from. Um, so I foraged a ton of glass, green glass and clear glass from Highbridge Park. I cleaned it in a very multi uh, stepped uh, process that involved pressure washing and boiling and soaking in vinegar. And then I um, adhesed it onto some cement board. And this is here I'm testing out all these different grout colors, light grays and yellows and dark greens. I ultimately settled on the light gray. Um, and so the theme for my, for my mural, and this is a small sample upside down, is um, I chose the American Robin, which is one of the 389 a species of North American birds that are threatened by climate change. And I wrote out the song of the bird in the form of a spectrogram. So it's like Robin language. And I made these sound clouds. You'll see more pictures of it shortly. Um, yeah, so that's what, what I've been preoccupied with for the last long stretch. Um, somewhere in the middle of the summer, I did a little residency at this place called the United Plant Savers, which is an amazing botanical sanctuary in rural Ohio. And I made my first spore prints. These are mushroom spore prints. So I went foraging for mushrooms and I collected a couple mushroom caps and um, laid them down onto paper and they kind of just dropped their spores. So these are wildly inspiring um, and it remains to be seen what I'll do with them. Look at this, this is a bolete mushroom. All those other mushrooms have gills have these little dots. Isn't that beautiful? So next step, we'll be experimenting with mushrooms. Thank you so much for visiting my studio. It was great to have you. Thank you. Um, Jessica, it's so great. You know, um, as, I, as I'm watching you and everything, it's, um, I, I really appreciate sort of discovering the world um, through your eyes, um, because um, it's, you know, it's exciting and there's, it's promising, there's optimism there. Um, and especially now, um, there are so many things I wanna ask you, but before we get into some sort of, you know, larger questions, I do wanna talk a little bit, and I'm hoping you might talk a little bit about this fascinating, you know, first of its kind Audubon mural project that you participated in. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this project? I know this was a new area for you. Um, and that it came out of this, you know, passion that you cultivated during the pandemic. So can you take us through um, how you got there, the process and, and your work? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so I first heard about the Audubon mural project when I was doing a, an artist residency back in 2018 for New York City Audubon on Governor's Island. And um, Gabriel Willow had invited me. He's a master ornithologist and also a wonderful artist in his own right. And he introduced me to Avi, who is the creator of the project. And he's the gallerist that works along with Audubon to, um, to host this, this mural project, which has, I guess they've created now over a hundred murals of these birds that are threatened by climate change. And so back in 2018, um, I had started talking about what I was gonna do, but it kind of fizzled out. Um, but one year ago, uh, a beautiful mosaic mural went up on 
on 163rd and Broadway made by the artists Carlos Pinto and John Sear, wonderful artists from Brooklyn, master mosaicists. And I just thought, oh my God, I wanna make something like that. I wanna learn how to make mosaic. And, um, and I happened to be making those little bird collages, the recycled bird collages at the time. So it felt like it was a good occasion. So I reached out to Avi and I said, I'm ready to do one. He said, great, you were on my list for this year. And, um, and, I, and I reached out to John and Carlos and they became my, my mosaic mentors. Um, they were super generous and just kind of like took me by the hand and step-by-step step taught me how to make mosaic. Meanwhile, I started to um, make these trips to Highbridge Park, which is, you know, the long narrow park that spans like from 155th to I think Dykeman. Um, it's a beautiful and really interesting park. And it's also uh, one of our lesser maintained parks. There is glass everywhere. And um, so here, here you can see, and I, th there's just glass embedded in the, in the paths. So I would go on my own or with volunteers um, to pick up the glass and I would kind of color sort it. I'd have my green bucket and my clear bucket and my brown bucket and um, take it back and, you know, yeah, there it is dirty. And then I would power wash it and boil it in vinegar and boil it in hot water and um, clean it all up. So that's how I made the mosaics. And I, I would, I'm just, I took a, some bird, I took so many nature nerd classes during quarantine. And one of them was bird song, which I just sort of fell in love with trying to learn how to identify. And um, so I knew I wanted to, Lee, I, I, by the way, I chose the American Robin, which is like a very common bird um, because I like to work with sort of everyday things and see what's kind of special about them. And so I knew I didn't want to include the bird itself. I wanted to work with the absence of the bird because that's sort of the point of this project is, you know, that these birds are threatened. Um, so, so here's an example of the Robin song in the form of a spectrogram through the glass. And it was a tedious process, I have to say. I mean, as much as I was excited by it and learned to learn all these new skills, it was really hard. <laughs> Mosaic is hard. It's physical manual labor. Um, but ultimately, yeah, there's cutting involved. I'm learning how to cut glass. And um, I mean, basically every step of the process was new to me. So it was a giant learning curve. And, but I think one of the greatest things about this project for me was um, that it, I really didn't do it alone every step of the way, it was kind of community supported. People came out and foraged with me. And even when I was out getting the glass myself, um, strangers would walk by and interact and sometimes help or offer to help in the future. And, um, and then the process of actually, I mean, I've never made a mural before. So I had to learn how to paint a wall and found, you know, painting, painting mentors and assistants, um, including my grandmother, who I believe is here on this call. She was one of my most important um, mentors and helpers during this process. Um, so, so yeah. And then, oh, so the other piece of the mural is it's the bird song, but it's also these blue hands. Um, I would, I was going for Robin's egg blue. So I cast the hands. This is making it, this is a photo of me making a mold of six people who live within the area, live or work within the area, who are actively engaged in some kind of environmental justice or stewardship. So I, I, um, so I wanted to cast their hands uh, in a pose offering sanctuary to the robins. Um, so here we're looking at a, you know, so I've made the mold and then I pour the cement into the mold. And these, these are some of the hands of, of our local environmental stewards. Um, and in, in briefly, I inserted a, a nest into one of the hands, but that was short-lived. Um, yeah. It, it's such a fascinating project. And Jessica, yours was the only, I mean, you know, so, I mean, this is part of a, a larger project. And of course, you know, yours is one of, you know, the only abstract um designs um for this project and of course you know um you know the idea here is sort of the, the absence right of, of the bird which i think yeah. um is is the point that 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 you're making here um 
explain, I, I mean, I think one of the things I'm really fascinated by, and as I sort of, you know, read about your work and, and is, is, you know, you talk about these sort of new skills that you sort of mm -hmm. you know, accumulated in this process. And that sort of seems to be like, you know, the, 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 the light motif of your life. I mean, you're, you're constantly yeah. <laughs> accumulating mm -hmm. um, skills um, and, and just different, you know, working in different mediums and, 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 you, and you don't shy away from any of that. Um, tell us a little bit about that and tell us a little bit about this notion of, I mean, you know, never having done a mural and taking on a mural is, you know, is, I mean, you, you, you make it sound sort of, um, effortless in a way, but um, it's certainly not. I mean, this is, this <laughs> Definitely is not. enormous, sure. enormous um, <laughs> enterprise. So tell us a little bit about that process and tell us a little bit about um, how that has impact, you know, what kind of impact that has had on your body of work sort of moving forward and, and sort of as you think about the trajectory of, of sort of the, your next projects and, and the things that you'd like to do. Sure. Well, um, sometimes I wish I was like an Agnes Martin or somebody who kind of finds their thing and just does it. But I keep, I keep, I don't know, I'm just kind of guided by like what, by whatever excites me next and I go with it. And most of the time it's something completely new. Um, and with this project, yeah, it was definitely anything but effortless. It was like, a, I would, it was, a, it was a, a lot of heavy lifting, but it was a passion project. You know, I just, I had to do it. I had felt the calling and, um, and it occupied my every moment, every waking moment for, you know, six months or more. Um, but happily, I mean, many with plenty of fretting in between as everyone who knows me knows. Um, and I, as soon as it was done, I was certain I was gonna retreat into my studio and make small, quiet, isolated things for a long time. Cause that's generally how I work. Like, uh, but I don't know, I think I might have been bit by the kind of public art bug. I'm, it's exciting to think that way. And it feels very new. It's true, I had kind of dabbled a little bit in public art. I had done some of those bodies into window installations with Chashama in 2017, and um, along with another wonderful local artist, Rachel Sidlowski, um, exhibited in Fordham Plaza in 2020 in the, in the winter. But, um, this feels like kind of new terrain this year. And I was also, I was working earlier in the year on a proposal, which hasn't yet come to fruition, but another public art proposal that's sort of in a similar vein um, where I'm thinking about how to transform waste um, into, into a more permanent um, installation that is also about honoring and revering nature. Um, that's, a, that's a collaboration that I did with a with a landscape architect firm called Future Green, um, particularly with, with an artist architect named David Sider. And we, and I, I'm also continue to be interested in sort of community minded work. So we came up with this proposal in which um, there's these community walks where this was originally slated for, for a site in Philadelphia, but um, could be for anywhere where we would go on these community walks and pick up plastic. And, uh, and we discovered there are these wonderful um, designers and engineers who came up with processes uh, and machines that will um, melt and reconstitute plastic and make them into these like beautiful and precious objects. So we wanted to, and they offer, you know, the instructions on how to build your own machines to do that for free. Um, so, we, we would hope, we hope down the line to be able to, to take this plastic and embed it into these kind of tall concrete pillars um, that we're, we're envisioning as these kind of totems, nature protectors. Um, so, yeah, so I guess I'm, I'm both wanting to turn in and do some quiet drawings, but also I keep thinking about kind of bigger scale things. And, you know, I just, just today I saw a posting for, uh, or my somebody, my grandmother shared with me a post. She's also a wonderful artist. A posting for you know a public art call for a New Jersey coastal climate resistance piece. So who knows? Yeah. So it it sounds uh, you know it sounds like um, 
COVID had a, a, a sort of, a, a, you know, I mean, it has obviously it has influenced everybody and, um, but it really has had, it really has informed sort of the, the course of your, of your work and, and your art. And um, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, um, that trajectory sort of, you know, from the beginning and, and, and sure. because I know, you know, some of the conversations we have with artists is, is this notion of being productive um, right. and, and trying to find meaning in their work and, and, and what does that look like? And so um, it, it sounds very much like you really engaged um, with uh, sort of COVID and the pandemic in, in, in kind of very, very particular ways. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, well, I mean, in the first, initially in lockdown for several months, I didn't make anything. I had no, I, I was planning to work on that embroidery body. I thought that would be perfect. I'll be, I'll just stay home. Um, and, but somehow it was, I couldn't do it. I just couldn't work and that was okay. So I didn't put the pressure. Um, instead, I like, almost immediately turned my full attention to observing the local nature. Um, and I, I'm lucky enough to live right at the um, entrance to Fort Tryon Park. So I spent a lot of time in Fort Tryon, but even more time in Inwood Hill Park, which is kind of the most magical place on this island, in my opinion. And um, I learned how to use iNaturalist, and which taught me, uh, which kind of opened the whole world of identifying weeds and flowers and plants. And, you know, as it was, you know, as we know, it was spring start blooming in that first COVID, COVID season. So yeah, I, I just like my entire attention went to nature. And when I was finally ready to create again, um, the first thing I made were these giant portraits, collage portraits of weeds, of my local weeds that I had met. Um, and then it kind of took off from there. So I had had, I'd been interested in, in nature and learning to identify trees prior. It was kind of like a slow build, but COVID made it like a, like a ravenous hunger to learn everything. Um, I have not tackled mushrooms yet. That's definitely probably next. Yeah, I, I, I'm actually, I, I want to hear a little bit more about these mushrooms. So um, what, what, are, what are you thinking with, with those? So where are you with these mushrooms? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still very much, um, I still don't know. It, it's very much in like an abstract, excited ex idea. You know, just the, I was introduced to the ideas of spore prints, which are usually used for, in, with, you know, so that mycologists can identify. They're kind of used scientifically, um, you know, to identify mushrooms, but they're just so beautiful. Like you just take this mushroom cap, you put it on a piece of paper and you wait for several hours or a day and they just drop their spores in such beautiful and interesting formations. Mm -hmm. And I just, I'm also just awed by how little we know and understand about fungi. You know, I guess I've heard that we know we have identified like one or two percent of all the species that we imagine that there are, and um, and there continues to be releasing information about like the potential for fungi to heal us. Um, you know, there's all of these studies about psilocybin and how it can help people with addiction or facing you know um, end of life anxiety and. Um, but also microremediation and the possibilities of cleaning toxicity out of the soil. There's just like, I don't know, it feels like there's so much to learn. Um, yeah, and I don't and they're, know. They're I, also, <laughs> yeah, they're also, they're relentless. I mean, they, they, just, they just show up. And they and they show up. It's sort of in all of their kind of fantastical kind of um, beauty. And and I think people yes. are you know um, at once sort of intrigued by them and kind of scared of them. And, and you know, it's, it's sort of this, this, this kind of mystery that shrouds these mushrooms that just kind of show up, you know? Um, Absolutely. But then there's that other piece where, you know, researchers like Suzanne Simard are, you know, finally like being heralded for her research in mycorrhizal networks and how mushrooms are like the key component of com communication in forests um, and like, illuminating how intelligent forests are. So all of these things are, I, I don't know what I'm gonna do with it or what I'm gonna make with it, but I'm just excited to be thinking about it and looking at them. And I noticed that in this, the video that I sent 
the, I don't know if the quality was quite so good. I'm going to attempt to show you guys a, um, that bolit mushroom. Mm. It's so beautiful. It's crazy. Wait, I think we've lost. Oh. Anyway, I reference a walk with the New York Mycological Society. Oh, am I back? Yeah, you're back. Can now. you guys hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, I was just saying, I, I, everybody should take a walk with the New York Mycological Society because it's just a big group of super enthusiastic nerds who have a lot to share. <laughs> I, you know, you, you talk so much about nature and the natural world and, and, and you know, your investigations, um, sort of your visual investigations, your scientific investigations um, into the natural world. Uh, you know, talk to us a little bit about, um, I mean, you're born and bred in New York City. Yeah. Um, so how, you know, tell me a little bit about how New York has informed your work um, and, you know, this sort of, this, this quest to, to look at the natural world. Um, what does that relationship look like? Um, um, basically, like I was completely nature blind for like 35 years or something like that. And then all of a sudden, well, I take that back. Um, I was given an orchid when I was like 23. And when it rebloomed a year later by itself without my doing anything, that was kind of the, that planted the seed of excitement. Like that was miraculous. Um, but I was never aware of, um, I mean, I lived, lived always near Central Park and Riverside Park, but um, somewhere around like five or six years ago, I took a class a single, like an hour class at the Brooklyn Brainery about the New York City street trees. Uh, and it kind of awakened just like, oh, there's all of these other neighbors that I have not even noticed. And um, so it was kind of a slow evolution of learning, wanting to learn the trees and identify all the trees. And, um, and I've come to befriend some um, naturalists like Leslie Day, who lives in our uptown neighborhood too, who has written all these wonderful field guides and to the trees and the, all the birds. Um, yeah, so it, it's all kind of new for me, but, um, but it came on really suddenly. It's so interesting. And, and I guess probably the, I mean, the pandemic probably, you know, accelerated that a little bit. Sure, because there was the time to observe. Yeah. The time in the quiet. Yeah, no, that and also the solace that nature offers. Like, I mean, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's so interesting. I think you know that that sort of combination of of you know being a sort of a city a city person, and and I think also um, you know as I sort of said, there's something. Um, I think there's something really remarkable about living in a city where nature. Um, you know, continues to insinuate itself, whether whether you're noticing it or not. You know, it's right. just it just continues. It 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 does its job. No, you know, no matter no matter what. Um, right. And so it it does sometimes just take that that kind of you know uh, moment where it's something clicks within you, and then all of a sudden you start to see it. Um, right. This then, this whole other layer that exists. In the yeah. Right. Yeah. So tell, tell me a little bit more about, I know this project that you had sort of, you know, for Philly that you, you sort of mentioned before, mm -hmm. um, how would you, you know, kind of, you know, think about that project for New York? If you, if you were thinking about that um, in, in New York city, what, what would that look like? You know, I mean, we thought about like what might be an appropriate site for it, whether it's a botanical garden or, you know, because there's, there's, there's trash everywhere so we could eat you know if all, all we really need is um is some space to install these totems and uh and you know the ability to walk around and pick up plastic um we you know we had thought of it originally in its largest form it was a pretty big budget proposal and so it was we were imagining like 50 to 75 of these totems that you would kind of meander around and they were taller that you know they were 10 to 15 feet high and kind of like contemplative spaces to move through the totems. Um, so yeah, it could be installed in a park. I, I could see it in, in the gardens. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, I'm open to suggestions too. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I, I think, I mean, I, I think it sounds a lot um, like you, you, 
you know, you sort of said you're drawn now to this idea of public art, you know, sort of you've gone from this kind of intimate sort of small, um, you know, kind of working environment to sort of seeing um, the 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 value in in public works and and I think um, and you talked a little bit about community and and how that played a role in the mural that you did for the Audubon project. Um, do you do you feel like that, do you do you you know you talk about sort of having a calling? Do you feel like that's a, a calling for you now? I mean, do you feel sort of drawn to that in 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 sort of um, a new way? Is this a, sort of an avenue that you'll continue to to pursue? You never know, but I think so. I th I think so, and I I think another piece that continues to draw my interest is in um, considering how to reuse and repurpose materials and explore new materials. Um, yeah, I mean, we have a real problem. We have a real trash problem and mass consumption problem. And, and I have too much stuff. And, and I would just wanna think about what can we, how can I rethink the purpose of my stuff? And um, yeah, so, I think the answer is yes, but I but you never know. Maybe next week you'll find me not doing that. I, I'll, I just kind of go with whatever comes up. It's certainly so. I think um, Rachel has a question. Rachel, um, welcome. It's good to see you. Um, can you ask your your question? Oh yeah, sure. Hi Jess, nice to see you. Hi Rachel. <laughs> yeah, I'm really enjoying. I'm really enjoying this talk and. Um, I was able to see your your installation, the Audubon project recently, and I was just so blown away by it. And I'm always really blown away by your openness. Um, and I feel like you're an artist who is able to see opportunity um, in working with the community. And also I thought the use of the broken glass was absolutely brilliant. And I feel like um, you have this like uncanny knack for kind of like seeing opportunity and working with groups of people and materials where other people maybe wouldn't see any possibilities. So I was just wondering if you have some kind of philosophy, like life philosophy or artist philosophy about sort of just like staying open and, you know, uh, what you say yes to or, you know, what you what you kind of like select. Um, and how to how to spend your time and energies. Thank you so much for saying that, Rachel. I really appreciate that, especially from such um, an accomplished and inspiring artist. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think the answer is that I just um, I spend a lot of time now, like kind of pacing around the parks and with a notebook and asking the trees, uh, the plants. Um, to, and kind of, I just sort of, I'm trying to put the message out there that like, of I am really open and I'm listening and I'm trying to listen. And the idea of the glass really came to me um, on one of those park pacing days. I was like, well, what material should I use? I know I wanna do something recycled, what should I do? And then the glass was all just there calling out to me. So I think, um, yeah, I'm really in a place where I just, and you know, sometimes you, because you kind of, you hear like when the glass made itself known, there's just some kind of feeling that, that has a little bit of weight to it that I have to, that you have to acknowledge, you know, like sometimes you get a lot of different ideas and sometimes they'll come and then they'll go and some have, but some are more weighty and some you're just like, oh, I have to he heed that. So there's like a kind of trusting that's involved, if that makes sense. That's great. Thank you so much, Rachel. I appreciate um, your question. It's nice to see you. Um, <laughs> I think we have another question from Martha. Um, Martha, can we, can you, we're gonna, we're gonna unmute you. Can you ask your question? That's my grandmother. <laughs> oh, lovely. <laughs> Let's see. Hi. Hi, <laughs> hey, <guys>. welcome. <laughs> The question is actually from Cass, grandfather. Oh, Jesse, it's so wonderful to see you and hear everything you have to say, so brilliant <laughs> as always. I want to know if you can talk about the relationship between the natural world you walk through and mm -hmm. the interior world you're exploring in your self-portraits. Thank you for asking, grandfather. Um, 
<laughs> I don't know. I don't know if, if I don't, I don't know if I have words for that. Um, Cause that self-portrait project, as you know, I started that um, several years ago now. I had with the expectation that I would make a bunch of bodies and the project would be done, but it's still very much in process. Um, and I guess, I don't know how to answer that except to say that it's uh, a lot of unexplored terrain still to to adventure through and get to know in in the interior as in the exterior and um um yeah i i, I don't i don't really know i'm just still walking walking both of those paths thank you yeah. Have you have you put that project aside? I mean, is it something that's just something you you know you'll come back to? Is it something you're kind of you know deliberately taking um, a, a break from, or or are you? It's not so deliberate. Just other things have come and mm -hmm. and and captured my attention. Um, and I am I do int very much intend to I at least at the very least finish that embroidery body. I have I must. I learned embroidery. I taught myself embroidery. I. I embroidered that for you know almost two years, and uh, and then I haven't finished. So I must finish that. And I and there's other ones in in the works in my mind, but they feel a little bit pushed to the background. So um, and you, but also, I promise you, myself I'll keep going. You've also done workshops where you've taught embroidery. Yes, yes, I've been um, lucky enough to get to teach at the botanical gardens and um, and some on my own, and also for Fort Tryon. Um, I actually love teaching embroidery. It's a very meditative um, process and it's very nice to do in a group. How did you learn? What was your... Um, I, I, in 2019, in the month of February, I said, I'm not gonna pick up my phone and I'm not gonna see anyone and I'm gonna lock myself in my studio, like a self-imposed residency and I'm going to learn embroidery. And I did it through a, on a website. Um, called needleandthread.com and just kind of watched every two minute video on all these stitches and uh, and kept practicing. That's extraordinary. So this, this is um, a 2019 self-taught sort of you, I mean, you, you just picked this up because you wanted to spend time, I mean, away from your phone. This is how you learned. How to <laughs> no, I mean, and then well, you I became I, an <laughs> and produce I mean that's a, that's pretty extraordinary um well thank you I mean I I guess I had pro I'm sure I've done embroidery at some point when I was younger and like tried it here and there but I you know it's just it's sort of like I get an idea for the, the art says you need to do an embroidery body so then I have to learn embroidery and that involves yeah <laughs> I'll just I just oh I must obey <laughs> you know, I, 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 I love this because you, you, you keep talking about listening. I mean, you really are just, you're just, you know, you're just, you're listening to every, to every kind of impulse and sort Whim. of yeah. force and, you know, the universe speaking to you. I mean, that's, that's extraordinary um, to, to, to be able to do that. And that this is something that, you know, fairly recent. I mean, I think embroidery is something that we think that is sort of passed down, you know, from generation to generation and that maybe you were sort of, you know, taught this as a young child, but um, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's pretty extraordinary that this is something that you've sort of, you know, picked up in the, in the last several years to kind of, you know, feed your, your, your art in this way that you're, that you're listening to. Um, that's really wonderful. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm so, you also taught other um, workshops as well. Um, can you tell us a little bit about those? Um, yeah, I, I taught a brief workshop also at the Botanical Gardens on how to make a pokeweed berry ink which was another one of the things where one of the bodies called for pokeweed berry, which is a native plant that is beautiful. It, it creates this future, initially it creates this like very magenta, hot pink, um, but that up changes over time. Um, and I guess it's been used as ink for a long time, but it wasn't the most, it, it tends to fade. But anyway, yes, I taught a pokeberry um, paint, painting workshop and I, what else have I taught? <laughs> um, I, get, I, I teach drawing. Yeah, I teach, you know, I've been teaching drawing classes for a long time. 
um, I guess I sort of feel like whatever I'm excited about, I want to share. So, so I, I'll always pitch a class to whatever I'm excited about in the moment. That's wonderful. That's that's, I, mean, I think that's that sort of community component that Rachel was was talking about as well. Um, that's 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 fantastic. We we I just realized it's sort of eight um, twenty one now. Um, I would like to move to something that we do every um, you know Thursday night with Noma, and that is um, move to our rapid fire questions. So the way this works, and I think you're game for it, right? Um, is that I sort of just kind of, of. <laughs> kind of I just sort of pose some questions. Um, you know, we never know where the, where they'll go. They can be sort of light. They can be happy however you want to respond um but there you know sort of no pressure but i'll just ask a few questions um, okay good. give us a little more insight um and i'm so i'm i'm really excited to hear um your responses because i'm you know i, I have a feeling that i'm just i'm not sure at all what to expect and that's really <laughs> so <Okay. laughs> i'm gonna ask you the first question um what is on your nightstand um let's see an eye patch uh a white noise machine um, uh, and a book that's really boring called Song, oh. Song of Trees. <laughs> so, so, so are you just trying to get through it or what? what yeah, I, and I, I have allowed, today I said, I, I'm done. I'm gonna move on to an interesting book. <laughs> That it's, a, it's such a big decision, right? To move on from a book. I mean, it's like, there's a I lot really that goes gave it into my best that. shot. Yeah, and I really don't like to give up, but I just kept reading the same 10 pages over and I just don't want to do that anymore. Sometimes you just <laughs> have to make that decision. There's something very freeing about that, right? To sort yeah. of say, and I'm done with this book. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> give me a novel. To something else, that's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, what do you think you're going to replace that book with? Any thoughts? Uh, there's like 20 books that sit on my bedside table. Um, you know that, um, I don't remember the author's name, but who, the one who wrote H is for Hawk, the Helen Mc something. I'm going to read her newest book and okay. I don't know what it's called yet. Well, good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So here's another question. What are, I mean, what are two things that you would like to put on your bucket list? Whoa. Okay. Let me think about that because I I don't have a bucket list, but um, I, oh, I know I want to bike across the country like north, south and east, west. Oh. And um, I mean, I should learn another language other than Spanish. I'd like to perfect my Spanish and like the grandparents on this call, they learned some, the grandfather learned Italian at 70. I want to learn an, another language too later that's in wonderful. life. <laughs> that's fantastic. Oh, that's great. Which uh -huh. language do you want to learn? I don't know. I mean, I guess Arabic probably. Okay. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. All right. um, okay. So I'm very curious who or what is your favorite artist, your artwork, your art movement? What are some of your influences? Who excites you? Who do you think? And I know it's one of those questions, you know, I always think to myself, it's like the artist of the week. Like I'm so easily seduced exactly. by artists that it's like, oh, this week I love, you know. Um, so this week or tonight, we, you okay. know, if you had to think to yourself, you know, the artist, the artwork, the movement that, that you're kind of just, you know, feeling for whatever reason. Um, yeah. Because I can't say just one for sure. I know, it's, a, it's an impossible question, I know. I mean, like, of course, like the godmother who's always in, you know, the original inspiration is Frida Kahlo, that's a given. Um, but you know, like, um, and so, and Vidya Selmans, you know, the Latvian American artist is just absolutely always, always really close to the heart and consciousness, just her absolute single-minded devotion to observation is extraordinary. Yeah. And um, on that note, the artist, one of the artists of the week, but also of the last few years, Catherine Murphy, um, who's married to a professor, a former professor of mine at, at, in college, um, Harry Roseman. They're both wonderful artists, but I really respond to Catherine who has a show right now at Peter Freeman Gallery and I'm dying to see it. She, a, another master who just like hyper-realistic, but utterly transcendent paintings and drawings. Um, I don't know, but then there's like so many young contemporary artists that I am obsessed with. There's a collage artist named Maria Berrios, whose 
portrait collage portraits are just so stunning. And also another collage mixed media artist whose name I, I'm afraid of butchering, Jadeka Akunili Crosby, a young woman who just makes these giant, beautiful Xerox transfer painting collages. Um, I don't know, a million others. There's a Whitfield oh. Lavelle show on right now and I really wanna mm. see that. And I love his beautiful portraits of um, everyday black Americans on found objects. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I could just keep listing. You could just keep going on. What What is it about Frida? I mean, I, I what do you, what do you, I mean, what are you drawn to with her? I mean, she's such an interesting figure in that, you know, I think she's become this sort of icon and she's a little bit of a walking brand. And, you know, she, um, in that way, I think, you know, she's almost made for, for this moment because, you know, she, she is the selfie, um, you know, Queen in a way that we we That's really you know um but you know as an artist I think sometimes you know we forget not not you and not artists mm -hmm. people you know people forget to look at her her work and her body of work as an artist what is it about her um as an artist that you feel drawn to I think her courage um to boldly share her interiority um and her pain and her truth um and i think she's almost the opposite of us you know of today of selfie culture selfie culture is so instant and superficial and she was a like a slow observer of her mm -hmm. tumultuous insides and she rendered them so beautifully on the outside and um yeah i just think of her as like a fierce badass um yeah godmother for all women artists yeah. yeah i mean i mean yeah i mean she and i think she you know she challenged every convention that had existed about what the female body should look like or what it was made for or how we talk that's about right. it how we look at it and exactly and so you know um you know she's in that way she's she's really um extraordinary so yeah no that's right that's, yeah, it really, it's sort of a, a really fascinating uh, figure. I mean, she was, you know, doing things um, that I think no one was, was doing and certainly was not acceptable um, right. or prized in any aesthetic way. So I think that's fascinating. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, like, despite, uh, despite how overused her images, I mean, her work is continues to be, I think, like, crucial um, inspiration. Yeah. Correct. And I think that's important because I do think, you know, sometimes it gets, um, you know, her fame sort of obscures her, you know, her, her value and her contributions as, as an yeah. artist. Um, and right. I think it's, you know, it's very, it's, it's worth kind of repeating that, I think, um, because it is really so significant. Um, and it's funny, you know, not necessarily at the time, because I, you know, I don't think she had the, she obviously did not have the fame that she has now when she was painting. Um, but, but certainly it's something that has endured, you know, right. um, unlike her much more famous husband whose work, you know, um, a lot of people don't know anything about, you know, she, she is the more famous of, of the two, which is sort of a fascinating. Now she is, right. right? Yeah, it's sort of a fascinating kind of turn of events. Okay. Here's another question. This one's tough. Okay. I would not want this question, but I feel oh, like we can handle it. Um, describe yourself in three words. Oh man, I really know. shy, oh, re terrible really question. shy, really passionate, and really sensitive. <laughs> See, you did. I knew you. You just, you just get through that. Good. All right. Here's our last question. So okay. this, this is going to be just sort of your imagination. You're having a dinner having party, a dinner party and you get to and choose get to three choose guests. Three guests. Okay. Dead or alive, yeah. real or fiction. Oh my Who gosh. Was? Okay. Who uh, okay. Three guests. Um, I think I would choose three um, quiet, introspective artists. So I would, I'm going to bring Vija. I don't even know if Vija Selmans is quiet or, or introspective, but because of her, like she does like one painting a year, I imagine she is. So she's coming and Agnes Martin, cause like, I think she's pretty antisocial and um, who else? I just saw um, Colson Whitehead uh, interviewed on stage the other day and he was so funny. So he, he, he can come too. 
<laughs> hey, I mean, he's brilliant. He's brilliant, and he's and his book broke me, Nickel Boys. But yeah, he he could um, he could keep us entertained. <laughs> so, who, what are you serving at this introspective, brilliant um, antisocial dinner? <laughs> I guess homemade pizza. Oh, okay. That's all I eat. <laughs> oh, good. What do you put on your pizza? Oh, uh, uh, let's put some olives, mushrooms, and peppers. <laughs> mushrooms, mushrooms. Yeah, seem definitely. To be like, exactly. That's a nice way to bring it right back, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Um, this was so great. I feel like I could just go on and on asking you all <laughs> kinds of questions for the rest of night about all kinds of things. Um, this has been enlightening and inspirational and fascinating. Um, I'm such an admirer of your work, and I can't wait to see what you do with those mushrooms. Um, and I can't wait to see um, that proposal that you have for Philly, maybe making its way to New York, because I really think um, that would be a wonderful contribution. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, we truly enjoyed it. Thank you all for being here this evening. Um, it's been a wonderful, wonderful pleasure. Um, as I said, this is our last uh, Thursdays with Noma for 2021, um, but we look forward to 2022, uh, where we'll continue our series. And before we say good night, I would like to turn the mic over to Martin, um, who has as some uh, sort of information for us. Martin. Thank you, Nerea. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on Thursdays with Noma this evening. If you missed any of Noma's recent technical assistance series workshops, grant writing for artists with Michael Palma and producing, editing a standout highlight reel with Emmanuel Abreu, how to create your own website with Patricia Miranda, well, they're all archived on our website, nomanyc.org, for you to watch. Also archived on our website, is all of the Thursdays with Noma programs going back to April 2020 when the series launched. Great viewing material during the holiday season. And uh, you can sign up to receive Noma's weekly newsletter, see Noma's studios at 4140, become a member, view a calendar of uptown events, and also calendar your own events on our website, nomanyc.org. And coming in January of 2022, Uptown Arts Stroll Poster Contest with a $1,250 grand prize. See nomanyc.org for info. We are also looking forward to the new year and have exciting news to share with you, so please sign up and get our newsletter. We want to wish you all a very great weekend and happy holidays to everyone. Thank you, Martin. Happy holidays to you all and good night. And thanks so much for being here. And Jessica, especially to you. Thank you so much. It's truly been a wonderful night. Thank you so much to you guys. Happy holidays. Okay. Good night.